Hello, BookTube. No doubt you've been following with a wearied eye the progress of the OGBG Book Hall Wars. They spilled over the original confines of the original members of the OGBG and started enveloping other channels. Uh, but there was one channel we hadn't heard from. And for a day, 12 hours, we got a breather and there seemed to be peace on the horizon. And then we heard from that channel. I am, of course, referring to Jason Harrigan. His channel's new name is Jason Has Books. And we thought that we were free from him because he's in an intense lockdown, thanks to surging pandemic numbers all over the world. Uh, but no. No, he couldn't resist. He couldn't resist getting back into the fray, and it turns out that on top of his house, there is what history will call the attic of aggression. Jason went up into his attic with a headlamp in order to rummage around in boxes that had found their way up there, boxes full of books. So he couldn't go out and get books. He couldn't go out and do a haul. I might remind you, for those of you thinking, you know, isn't it a terrible ex uh, a extremity for him to be driven to, that he's going up in his attic to ransack for books? Before you start feeling sorry for him, I might point out, this is the guy who, right before that lockdown, was openly planning on social media a five-county book hall to bury his opposition. So he's no, he's no uh, white dove of peace. Okay? He went up into the attic of aggression for a reason. He came back down with a box load of books, and he made a 40-minute video. Who makes 40-minute videos? I swear. <laughs> anyway, I felt that his foray into the attic of aggression required a response. <laughs> and as luck would have it, I had what I'm hoping would be my last bitterly early pre-dawn appointment uh, down on the Orange Line and thought, as long as I'm a block away from the Brattle Bookshop and as long as they're going to be open in a few minutes, I should walk over there and see if perhaps I can find a four-leaf clover that I overlooked before. And it turned out I could. <laughs> so, uh, I want to show you. I got a bunch of books, and I want to show them to you. We'll start off with two mass market paperbacks. Uh, I'm I'm I have fallen recently out of love with mass market paperbacks. I've fallen out of love with printed books just in general. Good lord, 2020 cemented my love affair with ebooks. Just cemented it. In fact, I learned a lot more about how to manage them, how to navigate them, how to use them, how to manipulate them. So that if anything, my love is stronger than it ever was before. I have thousands of books of all descriptions and kinds from publicists, from friends, from a lot of very generous people out there in booktube land. I have thousands of books on a slate of metal and glass that weighs less than a pound. Uh, so, but, so I've fallen out of love with printed books just in general, but I've also fallen out of love before that with mass market paperbacks because they're smaller they're more cramped. I thought, if okay, if you're going to get a, a printed book of something, it should be a trade paperback with really good binding, or it should be a hardcover. But, like a lot of people out there, I suspect, the first true love of my life when it came to books was mass market paperback. And they are, in a way, as many people have pointed out, a, one of those rare instances of a perfect piece of technology. They, you, they don't require any power to operate. Their method of operation is self-evident. You can't misuse one. They're, and they're also incredibly durable and incredibly convenient. And for a long time, we're also incredibly cheap. It, the technology doesn't settle down like that into that kind of uh, trifecta very often. And I, once upon a time, even in this room, had thousands and thousands of mass market paperbacks. I used, my collection used to be mostly mass market paperbacks. Not anymore, and I don't miss that those days, but nevertheless, I no longer now reflexively turn my nose up at mass market paperbacks, especially since, as I mentioned in an earlier video, uh, older mass market paperbacks, anything older than the last 10 years, so that's what? Um, 80 years of mass market paperbacks. The, the, the whole lifespan of mass market paperbacks, which effectively aren't made anymore except in some of the genres, uh, is over now. And that means that by simple attrition, you're going to see fewer and fewer of them in the used book market. 
used to be once upon a time I would go to the Brattle Workshop here in Boston. I would go to the sale lot outside and whole carts would be covered in used mass markets. That's not true anymore. It's not true because people suddenly love them again. It's true because the ones that were in circulation were bought and died in house floods or house fires or were thrown away by not so much grieving relatives or whatever. The, the, there's an attrition in place. So you don't see as many of them as you used to. So when I do, I now look through them to make sure I, that I get the ones I want. And I got two today. The first one is a murder mystery, not just any murder mystery, but an English country village murder mystery which i am i in 2020 i read a ton of murder mysteries and started to really develop a sweet tooth for english country house murder mysteries stately home murder mysteries murder mysteries in you know minor pennywise the village of minor pennywise where the organist gets it in the neck and somebody has to has to investigate whether it's uh the really smart college professor of classics that who is the nephew of a lady who lives in the village and really has no business investigating a crime or whether or not it's somebody from the local constabulary or from Scotland Yard who comes in eventually. I've found a distinct sweet tooth for those. And so I found another one of those at, at the Brattle. It's Margaret York, who I also, I already know that I like. This is Dead in the Morning. And I, uh, this is uh, a Patrick Grant mystery. I've read one other of hers that was a Patrick Grant mystery. It was right up my alley. It was exactly the kind of thing I was looking for. And that is, that is uh, this. Uh, the easy, graceful life in Winterswick is rudely shattered when the Ludlow family's housekeeper is found resting eternally in her bed. <laughs> With the word murder, each member of the venerable and wealthy family begins hiding sordid and personal secrets, and the authorities are having a beastly time uncovering the truth. Onto the scene strides the inimitable Dr. Patrick Grant of Oxford, just in time to help decipher the baffling clues of this most extraordinary family mystery. Uh, he's the the... I, the latest in a long line of amateur detectives. It's not his job to solve these things. It's just he has a, a penchant for stumbling upon such things and then figuring them out faster than anybody else. Uh, Raymond Chandler had some choice words for what an actual police detective would do to someone like that. But uh, I love these stories anyway, and I already know Margaret New York is a is a known quantity with me. So. Uh, I already know that I'm that I'm going to enjoy this. Uh, and then the next one is also something I know that I'm going to enjoy because I've read it before. Uh, how are we going to work this here? Okay. This is science fiction. Uh, the the uh, Not so much the home of the mass market paperback, although the first mass market paperback ever printed was technically a work of science fiction. Uh, but uh, I've had this in hardcover. I've had this in trade paperback. I wouldn't say no to hardcover or trade paperback at all. And I believe I have this as an ebook. Uh, but I saw the mass market and all of these things were dirt cheap. So I grabbed it because, it, you know, I didn't want to just leave it for the for the wins. So I grabbed it. And this is by James Tiptree, a science fiction author that I love. I have praised her many, many times on this channel. And this is a late novel. This is Brightness Falls from the Air. Uh, this is a novel set in a, on a distant world, uh, Damium, that was once upon a time the home of an unspeakable atrocity committed on on a native species on native species of the world an unspeakable act of violence and poaching and degradation that the whole world is only lately recovering from and uh the place is a bit of a tourist attraction because it is also a perfect observation point for a murdered star there's a star that a near a nearby star Damien has a star of its own, but a nearby star has gone supernova and the massive wave fronts of detritus from that supernova explosion are sweeping through the solar system. So you can see it in the night sky. And uh, at the beginning of this book, a shuttle load of visitors comes to Damien and we, we, we see them from the, originally from the point of view of the, the small crew of people who are stationed there. A crew of visitors comes to, to the planet some to observe the murdered star, but it turns out very quickly that there are all sorts of cross motives in that group of people, some of whom are directly connected to the atrocity that happened on this planet, and some of whom may even want to revive it. And it's just fantastic. I, 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 I mentioned on this channel before that I love James Tiptree's novel, Up the Walls of the World. I just love it. If I could find a mass market paperback of that, oh, oh, oh my, I don't at the moment have one. 
There's one particular mass market paperback of that that I want. I know, I would know it in a heartbeat. I would get it in a minute if if, if I saw it. Uh, but I fell in love with that book. Absolutely loved it. And then this came out years and years later, and I it wasn't quite as much love at first sight. But I have found, as you know, I can probably expect from an author who's this brilliant. I have found that the more I go back to this later book, the higher in my estimation it goes. Uh, because James Tiptree was thinking and pondering the whole time, f refining her art the whole time. Uh, so it's very happy to find this. Uh, and we'll gladly give it a reread, even in mass market. I might have to reinforce the mass market to do that. Uh, and I will look around to see if I have any other James Tiptree in mass market paperback. But I don't think I have... The mass, there were mass market paperbacks of all the volumes of her short stories which as much as i love her novels her short story was her real stomping ground and there i have star songs of an old primate and uh uh warm worlds and otherwise and all i have all the the volumes those old volumes that were they i want to ask mark mark richardson but who knows when i'm going to be sitting in his living room to just talk about these things who know over wine who knows when we will do that again we'll film it if we do but i want to say it's del rey was it del rey that did all those they all had michael whelan covers uh uh well anyway one way or another i have all of those mass market paperbacks because getting all of james tiptree in one short story collection so far i don't think has ever happened Terrible, terrible shame. <laughs> uh, but I don't know that I have the my the beloved mass market paperback of Up the Walls of the World. Uh, but I'll gladly reread this thing anyway. So those were those were the two mass markets, two genre things: a murder mystery and science fiction. Uh, there were other things that I could have chosen, but uh, there'll be other trips to the brattle, especially since in the video in which Jason Harrigan renews hostilities in the Hall Wars, he explicitly mentions that there's plenty more to come, that he hasn't plumbed the depths yet. Of the attic of aggression. Uh, I tell you, it's always the Irish. Uh, but anyway, this next one, uh, I, I, I got most of these things in the bargain lot, uh, which is outside. It's next to the Brattle Bookshop. Uh, all the books out there are one dollar, three dollars, or five dollars, and there are thousands of them. And they're not put out there because they're junk. They're not put out there because they're falling apart, as is often true with outside barrows and other bookstores. Instead, it's just a, a random mixture of things. What will you find out there? What can what can the Brattle expect to sell? What is or is not collectible? That sort of thing. It, it, it's snap judgments that are made by somebody at the buying table uh, or in acquisition down in the basement. And these are somebody who were trained by one of the best book assessors in the country. So uh, you never know what you're going to find out there is my point. And uh, one one man's trash is another man's treasure. So I found a book that won't have much interest to many people other than myself, but I was overjoyed. This is uh, edited by Robert Ball, and it's the classical papers of Gilbert Hyatt. And there is Gil Hyatt on the cover, who was born in Scotland, but taught forever, for like 30 years at uh, Columbia, and who wrote a, a great book called The Classical Tradition, which I do not own. <laughs> I don't have a hardcover. I don't have any of the paperbacks. I've read it many times, but I don't at the moment have his masterpiece. Big, fat thing called The Classical Tradition. Uh, but he also uh, did a books column, Books, Men, and Places, I think was the name of it, forever and ever, and was well known for that. He was well known for that. And he also did, uh, I have it here, but I bet I don't have it within reach. He did a great book called uh, Poets in a Landscape, a really good examination, just a popular examination of some of the the marquee Greek, uh, Roman poets. And this is a fascinating volume. It has a full length, uh, of, of a fully detailed critical biography at the beginning. Probably the only biography this man is ever going to get. Then it has, the middle section is reprints of all of his classical writings. His occasional classical writings. Would you do something for a magazine, a, a specialist journal? There are three or four pieces in here that he had worked up for publication level of perfection, but he died before they could be published. And then the third part of the book is a, just an extensive annotated bibliography of all of his work. So I don't imagine there are going to be many people who would look at this and at, at, out there in the, in the sale lot and care about it. But I very much do. I very much do. There are going to be pieces in here by Gil Hyatt, who died 50 years ago, that I've never read. Talk about a treat. Talk about a treat. Uh, so that'll come in here, almost certainly. Uh, then this next book is meant to uh, redress an historical wrong, <laughs> I was informed. 
uh, by someone who would know, <laughs> I was informed uh, that my last Brattle Hall, although it had lots and lots of interesting books, I had nothing for the gays. And I looked back at the video, and I was horrified to see that that is true. And that must not happen. The gays need to be satisfied. <laughs> you don't want them around when they're not satisfied. And I have spent most of my life satisfying the gays in one way or another. So, so I kept an eye out today at the Brattle this morning for something that would satisfy the gays. And I found something that's not only, it's not only a token sop for them, it's also something of deep interest to me. Because I haven't read this in forever. This is a novel by Paul Golding called The Abomination. About uh, a young gay man's brutalized and brutal coming of age. Uh, that does a lot of things that I don't like in gay fiction. This came out in, uh, I want to say 1980. Uh, no, this came out in 2000. <laughs> this came out in 2000. Uh, it really doesn't have much of an excuse, but it, it, it is, I remember it, it's a first novel. It's, it's Paul Golding's debut novel. I, if I remember correctly, his author photo is one for the ages. <laughs> that is our author. Fills out a tight sheet t-shirt rather well, wouldn't you say? Uh, and it, it has, uh, all of the flaws of a debut novel. It's, it's, uh, full of purple prose. It's oratund. It's self-indulgent. Uh, it's self-impressed. Uh, without justification uh and probably worst of all and also endemic to a debut novels it's intensely predictable and it's about a young gay man's coming of age but it ta it partakes of the reason i thought 1980 is because it reads in large part like a pre-stonewall gay novel uh in which the, the the protagonist gayness is viewed as not just a byproduct of trauma but an ongoing trauma of its own this, this, there is very much an undercurrent of self-loathing gayness throughout this book. Throughout. The, the main character is traumatized as a little boy. And goes right on being traumatized throughout the book. So, the, so it's the kind of thing that bugs me about a lot of gay fiction. Because, and it's not dead. It's not gone at all. Garth Greenwell is building a career out of... Out of uh, gay self-loathing in, in, in fiction where, and the thing that bothers me about it, uh, is that it, it, uh, is a classic example of a bullied little kid in a schoolyard thinking he can escape the merciless bullying of the bullies by acting like them. Uh, there's nothing in being gay that is pathological. There is, there, there is feeling, feeling love or lust for a member of the same gender is not a disorder. It's not a sign of deviance. It's not, it's not something you should hate yourself for. It's not something anyone else should hate you for. The fact that people did, and maybe still do, is, doesn't make it valid. And it's nothing you should internalize. It's their problem. Even if they write the laws, it's still mainly their problem. And, uh, after Stonewall, <laughs> or if you're, if you're, uh, uh, What's his name? The name's gone right out of my head. Uh, we just saw something. The Lord won't mind. Robert Merrick. If, uh, if, if you're a couple of people, you know, then it doesn't matter if it's Stonewall. But once gayness entered the world in its own right, as a thing that you could be and that it was legitimate, there wasn't, as far as I'm concerned, there wasn't any reason anymore, no thematic call anymore for that kind of self-loathing. It starts to look more and more like the pathology that it is, and always has been, when it is surrounded on all sides by novels that feature just characters who are gay. <laughs> who, who don't, therefore, have to inhabit uh, the public restrooms outside of London's parks. They don't have to be there. They could be home with a loving partner. They could be holding down a job they don't have to be there anymore is what I, that's what i'm trying to say is that when when you have been freed from the ghetto and you go back there intentionally there's something wrong with you uh, but one way or another uh i saw this and immediately remembered how long it had been i haven't read it in 20 years i don't know that this author has this is his debut novel but i don't know that he's done much else i think he wrote one other book uh in all this time and i'm not 100 percent sure he's still alive I, probably he is uh 
But I remember when I saw this, I remembered all of those things, all of those drawbacks. It, it is a little wearying for me to read gay fiction that is so steeped in gay self-loathing, in the pathologizing of being gay. Now, I'm not saying that I know what happens if you take that away from gay fiction. It seems to me, especially in light of, of for instance, uh, the Supreme Court in the United States of America uh, legalizing gay marriage, especially in the wake of something like that, it seems to me that gay fiction has a lot of very fruitful reinvention to do and can't just keep on going being what it is unless you're going to pull a Garth Greenwell and decamp your character and your narrative to some benighted part of the world where you can still expect to be curb stomped. It, it seems to me that gay fiction has had a little bit of trouble adjusting to the fact that more and more of those benighted parts of the world are less and less benighted. That's a victory that you shouldn't you shouldn't be looking back on that fondly. But one, one way or another, uh, at least at least it hasn't gone so far as sort of wisty sentimental AIDS novels. We haven't haven't had that quite happen yet. So let's hope that it never does. But I also remember, in addition to all of those drawbacks, I remember liking huge parts of this. I remember thinking that huge parts of it were gorgeously written. So when I saw it, not only do I want to satisfy the gays, but I will give it a try. And just to just to make sure that you know that I'm still trying to satisfy the gays, let's take another look at the author. Yeah, that's the author right there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, then this next one is, uh, what have we got here? Oh, God, my ergonomics are all wrong. Okay, this next one was, uh, I've mentioned that the Brattle, there are sale carts. There are the whole lot. There's a whole lot full of sale carts. And at the very back of the lot, there's a dumpster. It's behind a chain link fence so that people can't readily see it. But that's where the books end up. They get rotated back and back and back. The $5 books become $3 books. The $3 books become $1 books. The $1 books get rotated further and further back, closer and closer to that dumpster. And uh, I've been been—I've seen this book the last few times at the Brattle, and I haven't got it, even though I don't have a copy. And then uh, today I grabbed it because I don't want it to be destroyed. And because I, a nice big fat hardcover is probably the way that I want to have this thing. I've had... Big fat mass market paperbacks, they are not workable with this book because it's 1,500 pages long. And I've had big fat trade paperbacks, and they largely don't work either. Especially if you're reading them in bed. They, they fall apart under the weight of the book. And this is a big one. This is The Far Pavilion by MMK. This is a huge novel of hers. How big is this, anyway? Uh, oh, okay, it's only 1,000 pages. But boy, oh boy, it's engrossing. It's, she wrote a large shelf of historical fiction, and this one is the one, the bottle rocket that took off, was the one that was longer than all the others. Uh, this took off in hardcover, and then, oh my god, in paperback did it take off. Once Upon a Time, this came out in, what, 1970? 1978, this came out. And it's, uh, there are large, many, many parts going on here, although a surprisingly small core cast. And there, it's the story of a, an Englishman who's born in the Himalayas, a man named Ash. And eventually, it's the story of his passionate love for an Indian princess named Anjuli. Uh, and that is the part of this book that you will remember, is that love affair. But there are all sorts of other things going on here. And a very slow and confident maturation of the character of Ash from a man who is as hard as the mountains among which he was born to someone who is more human. Uh, I, can, I, I can read you a little bit of this. Just to give you a sense, this is this is in Peshawar, and this is uh, the character of Ash dealing with a hapless friend of his who has been telling stories about his own ancestry, wildly fabricated stories about how his great grandmother or his grandmother was a lover of Lord Byron or whatever, and uh, he's been found out by he's been found out by society, and the woman that he's been with is bitter bitterly resentful of him having lied to her and made her a laughingstock for believing him. And he has a little interview with Ash. I, I won't read you a lot of it here, but just uh, just a bit. Uh, you aren't going, gasped George in panic. Don't go yet. Please don't go. If you leave me, I'll... Well, I'll only get drunk again, and then it's worse when I'm drunk. Besides, b b b brandy only makes me feel braver. I might g g go out and do something stupid, like going to the club this morning and m m making a fool of myself. <laughs> Then don't get drunk, snapped Ash, exasperated. And for God's sake, George, stop feeling so damn sorry for yourself. You don't have to go to pieces just because you've been found out telling a pack of silly tarradiddles about your grandmother. Who the hell cares what your grandmother was or wasn't? 
You're still you, aren't you? It's sheer poppycock to pretend that people only liked you because they thought your grandmother was a Greek or an Italian or whatever it was. And if you imagine for one minute that Belinda, that's the, the woman who found out the stories, or anyone else is going to spread around any stories about her, you must be mad. You know what it is, George? You've exaggerated the whole thing out of all proportion and been so busy feeling sorry for yourself you haven't even stopped for a minute to think about it sensibly. You didn't hear what Belinda s said to me, gulped George, if you had heard her. I dare say she was damn angry with you for telling her a lot of fatuous lies and only wanted to punish you for that. Try to use your head for half a second and stop behaving like a hysterical rabbit. If Belinda is what I believe her to be, she'll keep quiet about it for your sake. And if she's what you think she is, she'll keep quiet, quiet about it for her own. And that goes for her own mo for her mother and Mrs. Gidney, too. These two busybodies. Uh, for I don't suppose either one of them will care to advertise the fact that they've been a pair of gullible old tabbies. I never thought of that, murmured George, cheering up slightly. Yes, I suppose... His shoulders slumped again. But then no one spoke to me at the club this morning except Mrs. Vickery. The rest just looked at me and whispered and sniggered. Oh, stow it, George, interrupted Ash angrily. You turn up at the club on a Saturday morning as drunk as an owl and are surprised because people notice it. For the love of God, stop dramatizing yourself and start to try to keep a sense of proportion. He reached for his hat as a clatter of hooves and the jangle of a bell announced the arrival of a tonga, and George said wistfully, I'd hoped you'd stay on a b -b bit and advise me. It's been awful just sitting here alone and thinking. If I could just talk about it. You've talked about it for over an hour, observed Ash tartly. And if you really want my advice, you'll forget all about this and shut up about your great aunts or grandmothers, whoever they were, and just go on behaving as though nothing had happened. Instead of making a public ex ex exhibition of yourself and inviting comment, no one else is ever going to hear about it if only you'll keep your head and keep your mouth shut. You really think so? stammered George. Perhaps you're right. Perhaps it won't ever get out. I d d don't think I could bear it if I did. If it does, Ash, honestly, now, right now, w w w what would you do if you were me? Shoot myself, said Ash, unkindly. <laughs> uh, and that uh, gives you a sense that Ash is, MMK writes him as deliberately unlikable. Uh, but to the point, and uh, you can get a sense there, some, a bit of a sense for uh, why this book will probably never be reprinted, why its day of popularity is probably done. Uh, George has uh, the fashionable Edwardian stammer that we see in Brideshead Revisited and a bunch of other books of the period, but you can't do that now. You're disability shaming if you do that now. And that's to say nothing of the fact MMK was herself a daughter of the British Raj and grew up in it. She didn't learn about it in books. She learned about it firsthand. And the portrayal of Peshawar society, of uh, half-caste Indians, of, of uh, subjects to the British crown, all throughout this book, is, I am sure that the, the modern discourse would call it unthinking, unreflective, unhelpful, be better. Uh, and I'm not, I don't imagine that many social justice warriors would have the wherewithal to read a book this long, but they can hear gossip about it, same as anybody, and cancel it on that grounds. And I hadn't thought about that until I was reading bits and pieces of this uh, on the ride back today, and I realized, oh no, you could never reprint this. You can't defend this book any more than, than in some quarters you can defend uh, the other great gazillion-selling historical novel that weighs a brick, uh, Gone with the Wind, which has had cancel culture out for it for years now. The only reason that cancel culture hasn't been out for this book is because it's been out of print. <laughs> it, it, it shouldn't be. It's every bit as enjoyable a reading experience as Gone with the Wind. It's amazingly involving. Uh, the cover, the, the uh, press material... Uh, for St. Martin's when this first came out uh, was obviously written by somebody who had read it because they said some books are, some long books are so tremendously good that you don't want them to end. It feels like a love affair. And this book definitely does. And when I saw that it, you know, that it was poised for destruction it was going to be thrown away, nobody wants a big hardcover copy of The Property Billions, I grabbed it and I reinforced it a bit and may even reread it. I may do a buddy read with Jason of Old Blue's Chapter and Verse. We could do 200 pages a day. I think that might work. <laughs> uh, and then the last two books here are oversized. I, When I'm shopping at the Brattle, I am trying always to get keepers. Books I'm going to keep. 
not books that are just going to take an exorbitant amount of space until finally they get recycled to the brattle. That feels like a waste. And the books most likely to, to do that, to get recycled to the brattle, are larger books. They're going to be the ones that are going to go first. So I've been extra cautious about getting anything that's oversized. But some books only come oversized. They're not going to be a normal-sized hardcover, and they're never going to be a paperback. The first one of these is one of those. This is from Scribner's. I wish this was ten times as long, but maybe it doesn't need to be. This is a thin, but still comprehensive, uh, biographical treatment and overview of Lawrence Alma Tadema, one of my favorite Victorian painters, who uh, is the, the cover jacket... Uh, it says something really good here about him. Uh, so Aunt Amatadema, the painter of the Victorians in togas, was one of the most successful artists of the 19th century, receiving 100 years ago the present-day equivalent of 250000 for a single canvas. Yet within a few years of his death he, death, he was all but forgotten. If his name was remembered at all, it was as the worst painter of the Victorian era. That's entirely true and totally unjustified. I, I love the paintings of Florence Almadad. I absolutely love them. And I would have passed on this if it had just been a treatment, you know, because you've got this great biographical essay at the beginning that has photographs from his life, photographs of his people and his models and his studios. There is our artist at work. Uh, and I would have passed on it if it had been just that. But the back of the book is one color plate after another. Just one detailed color plate after another. Amazing. So this is the the this turned out to be the Alma Tadema book that I've always wanted. I have one other that was a more recent study of him, uh, but this is just a biography accompanied by paintings. So fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Uh, and this next one, this next one's mighty big, and therefore should I should have been extra cautious about it. But I've wanted this, and I have resisted getting it. Uh, whenever I saw it, I didn't get it when it was new. I wasn't in a position to ask for it from the publisher at the time, and I didn't buy it in a bookstore, and I also didn't ask for it as a present. I had a bunch of people who had been happy to get a book request from me, even something this big. I didn't do it because I was thinking, well, maybe you won't keep it. You know, maybe you'll get rid of it, and then won't it be a waste? And then I started seeing it in used bookstores, but always for $20 or something like that, and I, I have a, just a puritanical resistance to spending $20 on a used book. Uh, but I saw it today out in the sale lot. And that that means it's dirt cheap, and I, I will just clean it up. This is a big pictorial record of New Yorker covers. So I mentioned before, I love New Yorker cartoons. I think they're fantastic. I, they are pre-emoji emojis. And I have a great number of collections of New Yorker cartoons. But this is different. This is a, a collection with, his, with a historical overview of uh, the covers of the New Yorker, week by week, uh, with some covers. Here, let me show you an example here. Oh, just read. With some covers getting their own treatment and some text. Uh, and I, I knew already that this is this is a New Yorker volume to have. Absolutely, if you're a New Yorker fan like I am. But I resisted. I was just getting it new. I was just getting it when it was expensive. But this was dirt cheap. So I got it. This is going to give me hours of, of entertainment, and it will go in this room. It, it is the one of it is the only collection of its kind. So it will go in this room with my other New Yorker anthologies uh, once I'm done glomming all over it. <laughs> and that that is it. That was my Brattle Bookshop uh, book haul salvo specifically responding to the attic of aggression. <laughs> so we have uh, the complete book of New Yorker covers. Just one, page after page of New Yorker covers. Incredible. It's, it's the, the type of thing that isn't in any of the anthologies that I have. The anthologies have interior artwork. The covers are only barely covered in there. Whereas here, this is all that this thing does. Then a, a lovely, it's a bit thin, but a lovely book on Sir Lawrence Alma Tadema, one of my favorite Victorian artists who is, uh, as that cover copy may uh, hinted, you know, he is, he is largely scorned. Because his pictures are visible, and because they took lots of talent to write to, to do, so of course they can't be art. <laughs> uh, then we have the Far Pavilions MMK, a book that once upon a time needed no introduction. Really tempted to just reread this thing uh, right now, even though it's an enormous undertaking even for me. Then the Abomination by Paul Golding. This is his uh, a novel about a young man sexually coming of age. Uh, 
coming of age over and over again. He comes of age multiple times, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and then the classical papers of Gil Hyatt. A uh, bit of a specialty thing. I I would have grabbed this anyway, but I would I would have been very happy if the same person who dumped this at the Brattle also dumped the classical tradition. They just didn't. Sooner or later, the Brattle will provide. Uh, and two mass market paperbacks. We have Brightness Falls from the Air uh, by James Tiptree uh, and Dead in the Morning by Margaret York. So uh, a very full uh, Brattle Hall. Not quite so many books, uh, but goodies. <laughs> Real goodies. Hopefully quite a few keepers. I may even this time around, keep, I doubt I'll keep The Abomination. I'll read it again. If it really impresses me, maybe I will. But I, I will probably keep this copy of The Far Pavilions. I've had a million copies over time. But knowing that thought that struck me on the way back here, that, oh my, this is an index. This book is now on the index for our modern puritanical censors. This book is now banned. You couldn't reprint it. Couldn't talk about it. Couldn't adapt it at all unless you changed everything about it. Uh, so because we, we have empowered this, this group of censors over us, over our reading who will destroy us on social media, cancel us, uh, brigade and mass emailing campaign to our bosses or to our our spouse's bosses or to the principals of the schools where our children attend to get them expelled because of a book that their parent held up and says they like. All that kind of thing. That We, we have given power to those kind of people and they are everywhere now. So I don't think there's, I, there's any great rush for anybody to want to reprint the Far Pavilions anyway, but nevertheless, I, I thought, I, thought I would hold, I think I'll hold on to this copy. Who knows how many copies I'll see in the future. And there you have it. That was my Brattle Hall for today. I am not going to the Brattle this weekend. And uh, if I read the, the lay of the land correctly for U.S. news, I am not going anywhere next week at all. <laughs> I, uh, I know that quite a few of you have been emailing me with your thoughts about the fact that the President of the United States last week incited an armed insurrection to overthrow the United States government and breach the Capitol. So it causes a pause for me to say that sentence, to know that that sentence now exists as a thing that I get to say. I still pause in that. Uh, the President was impeached for that, uh, the only President in American history to be impeached twice. And we'll stand trial for it. Uh, who knows what will happen as a result of that. But in between now and then, there's the inauguration of Joe Biden, which for some reason, passing understanding, is not going to be held with him just swearing on a Bible in the well of the Senate, as was true for most presidents. But instead, is going to be held in some sort of gala, which will attract the same crazed Trump cultists that breached the Capitol last Wednesday. And that are promising violence already. The promising violence already, and more and more evidence is coming to light as feverish investigations are going forward. More and more evidence is coming to light that they had help from inside the government, that some Nazi congressmen and Nazi senators were helping them with maps and coordination and perhaps the promise of exoneration or legal help. And those things combine to make a prognosis for next week that I don't even want to think about. The thing that everybody's thinking about is that there'll be an assassination attempt on Joe Biden during the inauguration ceremonies. The thing that I'm thinking about is that there'll be an assassination attempt on Joe Biden by a member of Congress when he goes to Congress, that a, a sitting congressman will try to kill him with a gun that they have smuggled into the chamber. Uh, I... I would, I would like to say that such a thing is absolutely impossible. I would like to say that that isn't the way that Madison Cawthorn will get his name in the history books forever. But nevertheless, I'm going to be holding my breath all next week. I think most of America, the non-Nazi parts of America, will be holding their breath all of next week. And we'll just have to hope for the best. The intelligence agencies that were suborned on 1-6 uh, have now sprung back into, into, into action with a vengeance. And done the logistical things that you should do. They have highly publicized the fact that a lot of ringleaders that were caught on camera and doing selfies invading the Capitol are, are going to jail for a long time. This was not a lark. They, they, it, it was a great high during the afternoon, during the, the, the few hours where it was happening, but they're going to spend the rest of their, of their adulthoods in jail. And the U.S. law enforcement has been quick to publicize that fact as a disincentive. And there's also been, tech has also been 
quick to shut off the means of mass communication for these people. The places where they go to plan have largely been shut down. Not all of them, though. We will see. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is not only is this the last Brattle Hall of the week, but it could be there'll be no Brattle Halls next week. We'll see. We'll be in touch. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now because I don't want to join uh, the likes of Jason Harrigan as the kind of Irish surname loser who routinely makes a 40-minute video. Who makes a 40-minute video? <laughs> but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.